Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Seth Stephen Zavitowitz, author of Don't Trust Your Gut, the first book I've interviewed in six months that doesn't have a subtitle, although it has a super title, Using Data to Get What You Really Want in Life. It's published by Day Street, which is an imprint of William Morrow. Seth is a contributing op-ed writer for the New York Times, a lecturer at the Wharton School, and a former Google data scientist. He received a BA from Stanford and a PhD from Harvard. His research has appeared in the Journal of Public Economics and a bunch of other publications. And his last book was Everybody Lies, uh, which won all kinds of awards and stuff. So should you trust your gut? Why not? What is your gut anyway? This guy behind me doesn't have one. Um, you can search YouTube and you can find as many TED Talks saying trust your gut as you can find saying don't trust your gut. So if I've trusted my gut to determine whether I trust my gut, it's like the set of all sets that include themselves. So, you know, it's kind of the opposite of Gladwell's blink. Um, you know, whether you play the sport you love or play the sport that gets you a scholarship, if your manager finds a baseball player that looks like a bum, you can pay him a lot less than A-Rod and you might get a better deal. Um, you can raise your kids successfully, theoretically, by living in the right place. And you can find a really good mate by not shooting for the ones that are competed over so much, which the surface may mean the ones that generally are considered less attractive. And you can become a firefighter. Um, Seth also checks out twins to find out whether nature or nurture may control these life successes or not. So where does intuition, flying by the seat of your pants, flipping a coin, and making a gut decision come into play? Let's find out from Seth. Welcome, Seth. Thanks so much for having me. So why shouldn't I trust my gut? I have. Well, it's, you know, book titles that you always need a provocative angle. So, uh, you know, my first book was Everybody Lies. Don't trust your gut. Very provocative. Uh, you know, interesting, when I was writing the book, that wasn't the working title. I was just writing a whole bunch of cool data that was out there. And then uh, my publisher is kind of like came up with Don't Trust Your Gut, which I, I do love the title. Then I just added a whole bunch of sections about the gut uh, because, you know, I kind of needed to fit the title. I think a more accurate view of what I'm trying to say is just there's an explosion of data out there to help us make decisions. And clearly, that's better than just winging it. And assuming that you're gonna, you, you should just ignore all the data that can help you make these big decisions about how to be happier, how to pick a mate, where to raise your kids, where to live. Uh, there's just there's there's data out there that can really help you and be, can be consulted. So I'd, I'd say that's more the point I'm making. You know, there actually are studies that sometimes your gut can be really helpful if you've been in the same environment, practicing over and over again, uh, doing the same activity, your gut could be pretty reliable. Uh, but I didn't get too much into that, uh, despite maybe the provocative title. Well, the reason why publishers pick titles and covers generally is because they want to sell books. And owning a bookstore, I can tell you right now, this is a good cover. Not, okay. only, not only is the title provocative, but the picture is good because it shows like these lemming type fish going in one way and then this one outlier who's who's attractive <laughs> going the other way well um, yeah but the question is some people have been like is that fish about to get eaten uh, <laughs> by a shark maybe the other lemmings are the smart ones there so yeah well that's that's the basis that's it yeah. well i hear something so you know you talk about baseball a lot so i checked the mlb salaries and if you take the mets the dodgers and the yankees especially the Yankees, because they're kicking butt. They could conceivably beat the Mariners 116 in 2021. They got a combined payroll of 600 million bucks, and they're all doing good. The Orioles, Oakland, Guardians, not so well. Their combined payroll is 115 million. So does that kind of go against the money ball concept that you kind of? Well, yeah. So the motivation of this book is I'm a huge baseball fan, and money ball, book and movie uh, have shown the power of data analytics in baseball and the famous money ball example is the Oakland A's uh, using data, despite having a small budget to make the playoffs uh, many years in a row, have one of the better teams in baseball. I think what happened is the 
richer teams just co-opted the money ball methodology. So the Yankees have huge emphasis on data analytics, sort of the Dodgers and the Mets. And I think if, if everybody's doing it, then it's no longer an advantage using data analytics and it's just kind of an efficient market again. But the good news for people wanting to make decisions is you're not in baseball where data has already been, uh, you know, transformed how people make decisions. It's kind of like, a way I see is let's say you're in the dating market and you try to, uh, you want to get, let's say an attractive mate and you use kind of, uh, hints from data analytics to do it and you're not the most attractive mate yourself you still could leapfrog against the more attractive people because it's still early in the data analytics but maybe eventually if everybody uses data analytics then the attractive people would, would win out again using the data analytics but now uh, we're kind of in the early similar to the early stage of moneyball where you can have an edge being like the open eyes yeah well it's like um you know when you talk about attractive in so many contexts in the book you know you think of that uh tom brady picture which is everywhere including on golf balls now at the combine and yeah. he looks like Funny. you should never yeah you should never pick him and he's crying with his parents because he got picked 119th or whatever and then he turns out to be the goat and uh yeah but that wasn't data analytics that was just that was just a team that said <laughs> there's no one left yeah, the Patriots get credit for that. And Belichick's like, if we knew how good Brady was going to be, we would have drafted him in the first round, not the sixth right. round. Exactly. So they don't really get credit for the sixth round pick. Uh, but yeah, I think, yeah, I, I think, you know, there definitely have been the proof of the power of data has been in many, many different arenas. So in football, it may not have been in drafting players where it seems like the data hasn't been that useful, but in going for it on fourth down, uh, that's where the data revolution has kicked in high gear, uh, telling teams that they should be going for it fourth down a lot more than they thought they should and punting less and kicking field goals less. Uh, and some teams were really early on that and they had a big edge uh, by going on fourth down, going for it on fourth down more than other teams. So, yeah, I'm in Philadelphia. So we kind of, yeah, started. yeah. Philly special. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, that reminds me of talking about Brady. I'll, and I tend to jump around a lot and I tend to talk too much. So shut me up. But, um, I was thinking about what you talked about names, like, um, like Mayor Pete, you know, Buttigieg, no one could pronounce it for a year, but then you take a name like Tom Brady. And when I was, uh, in Gainesville practicing law, there was a guy named John Mills and he was in the state house. And I, I kept saying to him, John Mills, you got to run for president. It's like the greatest name for a president, John Mills. And, uh, you talk about well go ahead you talk about that and talk about uh you know that that program that you use to change to change your face into uh -huh. your rabbi into your rabbi oh yeah rabbi face <laughs> uh well names is interesting because that's something i definitely think about a lot because i have a totally unpronounceable last name uh and i sometimes Wait, do wonder, I get it right i got it right right yeah you so got it right but most people don't so uh right. and then sometimes i'm like would i be way more successful as a writer if i had you know, it was just Seth Stevens or Seth David or something that people could talk about. Like, I, I imagine people trying to recommend my book and then they like forget what my name is and they don't say it. And I wonder how often that happens. So, uh, but appearance, there's all this research uh, on how much your appearance influences your outcomes. Uh, so uh, they, they can predict 60% of congressional or 70% of congressional races just by showing a picture of the two faces of the candidates and saying which one looks more competent, which is super freaking depressing uh, and dark. Like we're just so superficial in how we pick our leaders. Uh, and, you know, it, it, we, we pick someone who looks the part, but then there are also these studies that you can uh, basically change how you look that you get your rating of competence or attractiveness or trustworthiness can be very different depending on uh, the particular photo of you. Are you smiling? Are you not smiling? What's the lighting like? Uh, do you have facial hair? Do you have glasses? So I did an experiment on myself because the book's all about data, using data to make better decisions where I created uh, using this app, face app, a hundred versions of myself. So sometimes I had a beard, sometimes I had no beard, sometimes I had a goatee, mustache, uh, glasses, no glasses, changed my hair color. I had pink hair in one of my uh, pictures and I smiled in some of my pictures. And then I uh, at, did survey research, basically asking people, how do I look? How competent do I look in these different versions of me? Yeah. I, kinda... 
I was going to say my, you know, when you talk about um, some of the statistics, actually some of the racial ones, which were fascinating and not good, but like my brother, after he got divorced, was on J date, like you did. And, um, but he's five foot eight and he's honest as hell. And you're, you can't lie about that really. But he said five foot eight and he, he definitely said it made an incredible difference. Um, so talk about the dating app, talk about the firefighter thing, which is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, dating, there's data from dating apps, yeah, that there's a big, uh, you know, it's kind of, they used to, to know what people were attracted to, they uh, just ask people, they say, what are you looking for in a partner? And everyone says, you know, I want someone kind, I want someone good character. They never say, I want someone hot, or I want someone tall, or I want someone in this occupation. But then if you look on what people actually click on, we get, you know, pretty much revolutionary insights into what makes people attractive. And you know, one of them is height that each inch of height seems to be worth about $40,000 for men on the dating market, uh, which is, you know, there have been these studies, Bumble, I think they have a height filter, and I think 70% of women have 5'10 or above, which means 70% of women immediately are knocking out 30%, uh, are knocking out 50% of men, because 5'10 is kind of average height. So, uh, although a lot of men do definitely uh, I, I was also a compulsively honest person and I'm about your brother's height, about five, eight. And I, I use the data where I learned there's, there are these like clips where they're just dramatically more women you get through the filter and five tens, one of the clips for whatever reason that, you know, the, like five, nine gets, uh, you know, like uh, five, nine gets through 20% of women and five, 10 gets through 70% of women or whatever it is. So I just started saying I was five, 10. <laughs> which I don't like because I first of all I don't like lying and also I don't love being with a mate who is picking based on that because I just I find that like a not ideal quality uh to be you know to be judging someone based on their height to that degree but <laughs> my girlfriends of now two years who I talk about a lot in the book did have five ten or above in her cutoff so lying was basically the only way I would have met her well, and then you can set it off because you have a really good one with your se sense of humor. You know, you can say, oh, man, I must have lost a couple inches on the way over here. <laughs> yeah. Good opening line. Yeah. Um, that, there was a time, there were a couple of times I bought these like things that you can put in your shoes to make yourself taller. And, but I just felt so ridiculous walking in. I was scared like it would like fall off in the, or like I just trip. And I was just like, I was in my head a lot. I'm just like, I'm not going to. That's not going to do this. And, but, and also my girlfriend is a little more worried because she's 5'10". So the other woman, they were, you know, 5'2", 5'3", 4'4", 5'5". I'm like, maybe they're not going to notice because I'm still, you know, she's still looking up at me. But I'm like, she's going to notice that she's <laughs> looking down at me. But then we met during the pandemic and she claims, I don't know how, whether this is true or not. She said she knew I was lying about my height just from our Zoom dates which I have no idea how, but she's like, she sensed that I wasn't actually 5'10". So when I, she actually met me and saw that I was, you know, a couple inches shorter than my height, she was already in her head prepared. So she went, she went with her gut feeling. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. But uh, it does kind of show the value of lying in life. You know, there, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it goes to the last dating. I yeah, think there's a fair amount week. of strategic lying that's probably optimal. Yeah. So if you're smart and you can read people, especially live rather than dating, you can tell in the first 30 seconds whether they're going to buy that, whether they're going to think the self-deprecation, which the Guardian review talks about with you. They go, oh, maybe he shouldn't be so self-deprecating. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, but th the thing is, I think back to this friend of mine when he had his girlfriend and they clicked. They were so they had the same sense of humor. They were both well read so many things that were together, but she was not attractive. And so like when he brought her out on a date or something and other guys were there, he ended up getting embarrassed and they ended up breaking up. And that's the only reason he broke up with her. And you talk yeah. about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of our, I, I talked about this when I was uh, doing interviews in my first book, Everybody Lies about where I studied a lot of pornography data. And one of the things that's clear in pornography data is that overweight women, there's a pretty, there's a, large market for them, you know, very, very heavy set women, you know, BBW women, they're called in porn, big, beautiful women, which are, you know, basically, you know, I think clinically possibly obese. 
Uh, and I think it's like the 19th most popular search on Pornhub, which is pretty high and kind of the first of body type searches. And uh, But then if you go on dating sites, you see that women face a big penalty for being bigger, for being overweight. And I think a lot of reason for that is that people aren't necessarily dating who they're most attracted to. They're dating who will impress their friends. And there's an idea that you know, when we think of the closet being in the closet, we usually think of gay men or mostly exclusively think of gay men. So, uh, so a guy, a man is attracted to, or a gay woman, a man, man is attracted to, an, an, to men, but he's concerned what his friends and family will think. So instead he dates someone he's not attract, as attracted to a woman. And I think there is closet behavior in the heterosexual community as well, where some people are, you know, are attracted to people, like people, whatever, but they don't want to date them because they don't want to bring them around to their friends. They, they're embarrassed. You know, I think a lot of men who are into heavier women would be embarrassed to introduce their girlfriends, uh, you know, who is obese, even if they're attracted to her. Which is a shame, but it, but it's, you know, almost, I would almost say universally true. You know, it's funny that um, that YouTube interview with your friend who had, gra I don't have graphics, but the first graphic she showed was the penis thing, which is interesting because it ends up being five inches. So talk about that. Like, I guess it's kind of like a bell-shaped curve. Yeah, it's a, it's a close to normal distribution. It's, uh, yeah, that people type into Google, my penis is, you know, three inches, four inches, five inches, six inches, seven inches. You analyze these data. It's like a bell curve centered a little north of five inches, which I don't know what to make of that. Like, it was just weird. It was so funny because it's such a bizarre thing to type into Google, which kind of was my first book that uh, just people are honest to Google and they even type full sentences into Google. They treat it almost as Catholics have used the confessional. Uh, and that's, I think, a great example of it. Well, why are you telling Google that you have a four inch penis or a five inch penis or six inch penis? But, uh, and I don't know, should, could you interpret that? I guess if I really wanted to go further, which I tried to get away from my naturally immature self. So I didn't want to, because when I wrote Everybody Lies, I was 34 years old and everyone gave me a pass. They're like, this reads like an immature person's <laughs> book, but I'll give him a pass because he's young. So now I'm, I'm, I'm approaching 40. So I'm like, I can't really just keep on talking about penis size for the whole book. And I, people expect a deeper level of analysis and thought and, from a more serious thoughts. So I, I didn't, I could have gone out, but I could have really dug deep and say how it compares in different countries, like the bell curves, how it compares in different communities, but I didn't do that. Yeah. Well, wait, you get to be 70 like me and find out that you're still acting like you're 12. I mean, <laughs> I haven't changed. I see no, people don't change. I don't see any reason for you to change. Okay, so, fine. <laughs> well, I'll, uh, next book, I'll, uh, I'll quote you as encouraging me to go back into penis size analysis. As long as you give me some kind of kickback. Um, yeah, I was, that's another thing. Oh, oh yeah. So with Gladwell, today I was driving and I was coming around this blind curve and this Pico, Philadelphia Electric Company, truck comes right at me and I'm totally unconscious. But I immediately somehow got out of the way. It's like the idea of moving your arm before you actually have the conscious thought of moving your arm. That's not the same thing, is it? Or is it the same thing? It's, it's the innate, it's the... It's the basic of gut feeling, you know? Like, no, there so are yeah, there are definitely times where you can't do, I, I think uh, where you just don't have time to do a bigger decision. So athletes, obviously I'm a huge sports fan, as you can see from the book, all my books basically. And then uh, you, uh, you know, athletes have to train their intuition to be very good to, you know, a quarterback has to know, has to sense whether someone's attempting you know, getting to him on the blind, on his blind side. So you can step up, step away. Uh, now a better way would be to collect data and slowly, I, you know, if he could watch video and see and decide what he should do based on that video, he could come to a better decision, but he doesn't have that option. So I think some of what I'm saying is some of these arenas, they don't need to be gut decisions. If we're deciding, uh, you know, that, yeah, I can, how to parent or where to live or you know how to be happier we don't have to make split second decisions so even if our split second decision making can be surprisingly good at points it's obviously not perfect even your decision what to do when the cop came uh 
you know, you probably you could have made a slightly more optimal decision if you really had 10 minutes to think about exactly the right way to do it. And I think for some of these big decisions, it's silly to not utilize uh, the, the, the availability of uh, deep reflection and thought and data analysis. Well, I get it. Like both of us love sports, so we got to get away from it somehow in this conversation. But some of the analogies still work. Like, for example, you know, initially, like in the first chapter, I think you talk about, you know, again, the money ball analogy, you know, don't bun so much and hardly ever steal. It's like this guy I interviewed. I interviewed this guy who wrote The Digital Mindset, which comes up next to your book in Amazon, too, talking about oh, really? data sets. Um, and then uh, I interviewed this other guy who wrote about odds. It was a fraction book. And the idea is like in baseball, okay, yeah, don't, he says, go, when you go to the track, don't bet on the 20 to one, bet on the favorite. You're going to end up making money slowly, but your gut feeling is I want to win the 20 to one. You know, I want to win that one. I don't want to win $2 and 80 cents. But what I was going to say was, you know, they always say the, the hardest feat in baseball is uh, hitting a pitch. Whereas the bunt and the single and button the slide is something that you can analyze with a data set. But how in God's name are you able to hit a, a hanging curve when you have to start swinging as the ball's leaving the pitcher's hand? I never understood that. But even that, but that, those are areas even where data has improved. True. You, know, you can be told uh, you're swinging too much at, you know, pitches out of the strike zone outside, or you're swinging too much at, curveballs that break below the and then you know retrain your intuition but of course it's always it's going to be gut because again you don't have time but yeah the point of it yeah i think the maybe the mistake people make is our gut is amazing which i you know i'm just thinking out loud i didn't necessarily talk about this in my book maybe i should have but our gut is amazing as gladwell can be amazing as gladwell pointed out in making these split second decisions but obviously it's imperfect and even baseball players uh, uh, only get hit base hits you know, 26% of the, percent of the time. Uh, and so as, as cool, as great as it is, it's flawed and it only really should be used when we have no other option. Uh, and if, if that's how you're deciding, uh, you know, what career to pick or, uh, you know, again, you know, I'll go, I could go through again, all the examples they're talking about in this book, then I think you're really making a mistake because why rely on this, method that obviously is you know any half a second of thought would say is going to be uh imperfect yeah uh, the guardian review gives you a pass on that one too because they say the book title is what it is but it could also be titled don't trust your gut until you trust your gut you know uh, yeah well they're, they're like don't trust your gut uh except when it's when it works or something but they, they made a good they made a really good point that you know, when you write a nonfiction book, a data science book, or a psychology book, there's so much pressure to shock people. So, you know, the, usually the first question in interview is what things surprised you, what things shocked you. And I think that pressure is horrible for accuracy because a lot, we have a, a replication crisis in psychology because everyone finds these flashy things that you know, get on the front page of the New York Times, you know, if you just look, stare at blue, you'll be more creative or uh, ESP, there's some truth in ESP. And, you know, you hear it, it's shocking. And then we find out five years later, it's not true. Uh, so I think what I try to do in this book is just present the truth to people, whether it's shocking or not shocking. You know, sometimes it, it was surprising. I don't know if anything rose to the level of shocking but I think, you know, sometimes they were a little bit against what you might have guessed. And sometimes they were exactly what you might have guessed. And that was really important to me. And I think the Guardian Review cor correctly pointed out that that's kind of my point. Because if our gut or if our guess was always wrong, we could just do the opposite of what we guessed. So it's like if, if someone, every time they thought the stock market was going to rise, it actually, if everyone thought the stock market, every time they thought the stock market was going to fall, it actually rose. That would be you could make huge amounts of profit off that person, right? You could just bet against his gut or intuition. Uh, you could do that with me, yeah, yeah, yeah. And but 
and if our guess is always right, then we wouldn't need data because we could, we're just like, oh yeah, I always know, you know, I know exactly what activities will make people happy and exactly who's secretly rich in the United States and, and et cetera. But the fact that our guess is sometimes right and sometimes wrong is why you need data because we're, we basically don't know when we're right or when we're wrong. Yeah, but like classic example for me is, and it made me hate him, is Nate Silver at 538. And it's like, night before the election he's got hillary winning by like a landslide and there's no possible way that trump could win you know and i voted for hillary but i voted for her like i hate this woman i don't like her she's unattractive she's a liar but i voted for her because i'm as left-wing as you can possibly get but he was completely wrong and all he used was this enormous data set that's all he used so why doesn't that work it didn't work what you're saying uh, didn't work i think nate silver got it unfairly attacked based on that because he said if you look back the day before the election he said trump had a 28 percent chance of winning so well uh hillary clinton had a 72 percent chance of winning that's very different from saying hillary clinton is definitely yeah gonna win. I, yeah you're right i exaggerated but i think people people have a hard time with probabilities if you say something has a 55 percent chance of happening and then it doesn't happen people say you're 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 wrong that's not really true if, if every time you say something has a 60% of chance of happening, it happens, then you were wrong to say it was a 60% chance of happening. If, you say, if it happened 60% of the time, you were right. Well, it's uh, like when you were talking about the Emanuel brothers, and I interviewed Zeke when he wrote the book, and I thought, you know, you're saying, why did this happen? Nature versus nurture. And the, other, the thing is, like Stephen Jay Gould, some, he was given a talk and some lady in the audience says, I, all this coincidence thing and natural selection, I don't believe because I was laying in bed and I just thought the FedEx guy is going to come and knock on my door within the next 30 seconds. And he did. So that means something. And he goes, well, how many times have you thought that? And he didn't knock on the front door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's yeah, exactly. what I feel about the uh, Emanuel brothers. You know, they go, what did, what did the mother put in their cereal and all that? I mean, the Beatles were together, but the reason why they were, were who they were, in my opinion, is because these three guys got together. There wasn't any particular way you could analyze a data set and say that George and Paul and John, I just miss Ringo, got together. I mean, it's a lot of this is just the karmic wheel, the great Mandela, I think. I think there's a lot of truth to that. There's a lot of chance in, in life. And, uh, you know, after the fact, we kind of look for patterns that were just lucky, but sometimes there are things that increase your odds of success. So, uh, I don't know. I talk, I talk about that. I have a whole chapter about luck and ways you can get luckier. So one of the things I like to say is that, uh, you know, your biggest success in life, if you look at any person, a business, a, an individual, an artist, their biggest success is going to be have a lot of luck involved in it. And they, they'll say all the lucky breaks, but that doesn't mean they were an unusually lucky person because over the course of a lifetime, you're supposed to get a whole bunch of lucky breaks. Uh, if you got no lucky breaks over your whole life, you'd be the least lucky person ever. Right? Yeah. Well, my dad used to say, you know, if opportunity knocks and you're laying in bed and you don't get out of the bed and answer the door, then you consider yourself unlucky. Yeah, yeah, exactly a lot of it too i like the way he said flashy because it reminded me in the book where you say shiny which reminded me of a magpie oh and yeah i think that's a lot of the way i think that's the way a lot of us just knee jerk gut respond we see someone pretty we go after her she's on a well it's like uh rodney dangerfield he goes love is blind you know how many times have you seen this really handsome guy walking down the street with this really ugly woman and go no nah, i've never seen that yeah i've never seen that have you seen that yeah i remember i know that but it's not it's, it's not quite true it's not, uh, it's not a hundred percent. No, it, well, there you go. It's not a hundred percent, but yeah. Yeah. We I mean, there are some, sometimes you see a movie star and you see their wife and you're just like, Oh, I would have expected better. And not, not, not always, but it happened. Mel, Mel Gibson is a perfect example. Yeah, you're right. I mean, but the other thing is it's part of, it's kind of hardwired. Like if you're walking down the street with your girlfriend and this beautiful girl passes by your neck is going to turn whether you want it to or not. Yeah, there's a difference between turning your neck and dating them and marrying them. So that's kind of the difference between gut. That We don't have to approach dating with our gut instinct. We, it may be impossible to overrule that instinct of you know, being drawn to someone who's beautiful, but it doesn't mean we have to marry them. I think it's interesting. Sometimes I feel like it's almost easier when you do have that tall, handsome person or a movie star or a rich person 
it's almost sometimes easier for them to not date a super beautiful person because they don't have the same pressures that other people have. They don't need to prove anything. You know, Brad Pitt doesn't have to right. show it to, to anybody. I, I have a couple of friends. I, I know a couple of people are acquaintances. One person's incredibly good looking and, and ex- worth hundreds of millions of dollars and a talented musician. And his wife, I think, would not score like off the charts. Uh, you know, if you did the one to 10 rating, I don't know if she'd be a 10 necessarily. And I think it's probably easier in that situation because there's nothing to prove. Uh, it, it, it's like uh, the ultimate alpha male behavior, I think, is being rich and sitting in economy class. <laughs> it's like, I can't do it, but I don't, I choose not to. And the, so I think there's, there's probably something to that in, in dating. Yeah. I don't know. I agree with that, you know. Yeah, I mean, you can either want a Lamborghini or not want a Lamborghini. It's the reasoning behind why you want it, or you yeah. can rent, or you can rent one. Yeah, it's similar to, uh, yeah, Mark Zuckerberg was look what like I think got a uh, uh, Honda or something, Honda Accord, because he's like, I just need a functional car. Car. Yeah, but and that's then- it. But nobody's like he doesn't need to prove anything. He doesn't have to prove he's rich. So it's the ultimate. It's it, the the incentive to prove something is much smaller when everybody right knows it. So, you know, if you're, yeah, if you're ready at the top of the dating market, if you're beautiful, you don't have to, you probably feel less pressure to prove your worth. And maybe, I don't know, it'd be interesting to study if you then feel less of a draw, if you're more likely to go with what you actually are attracted to and less likely to be driven by social pressure. Well, yeah, also an interesting study and you kind of, maybe while you're talking about it would be like Jeff Bezos theoretically the richest man in the world building the most expensive yacht in the world that they have to take a bridge apart to get the yacht passed. What are you going to do with it after you have a $500 million yacht? What exactly would you do with it? Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the opposite of my point. Cause right. Well, but I think the complication is that some people who reach the top are so probably so driven by desires for status that you wouldn't have worked that hard to found Amazon if you didn't want your, you know, a phallic symbol to put a phallic symbol, your own phallic symbol in space. So it looks so, it's so perfectly done. It looks exactly like it. And then, you know, you have to wear the cowboy hat and have a tailor come out and adjust the crotch of your pants. But I always think that everyone should have like a kid who was like their best third grade friend, no matter how famous they get, he should ride with you all the time and be able to say to you, I don't think that cowboy hat is the right way to go. Because it does, it does feel like successful people end up, I, I would say, like to see a study on this. They maybe need to do my study on competence looking, because it does feel like a lot of them end up with horrible haircuts. Uh, be, and I think in part because they're just surrounded by yes men who are telling them they look great no matter what they do. So Kim Jong-un, you know, dic- dictators, <laughs> They just, nobody's going to say you look like an idiot and a fool uh, with this haircut and uh, they, that, they, they can't get in trouble. So they probably need to read my chapter on how to find what looks best for you more than anybody. It's funny though, you know, some of the things you talk about in terms of percentage of salary increase, it's going to offset your attractiveness is either an occupation or the way to let you look. And then the idea of, okay, let's not go after the most the woman who's most competed for because the chances of my prevailing are minimal. Um, And then, so let's go after somebody else. And it's almost like Machiavellian in my mind to the way you approached it. But because you're saying, okay, in order for you to be happy and succeed, here's what I'm telling you might be a way to go. And I don't, is that, what am I mischaracterizing here? (laughs) I, I think there's some truth to that and that I do go through life a little mischievously and think I, I probably do more than the average person think of like hacks and ways to kind of get what I want with minimal effort. Uh, you know, I, uh, in college, I'll give you an example. In college, I went to Stanford, and I, you know, obviously great, great school and it's all type A people. And the first semester, you're allowed to take per semester 12 to 20 units of course credit. Uh, that's some, some are between 12 and 20 units. 
And the first semester, everybody in the my dorm was basically talking about the same thing. How can we do more than 20 units? Like, how can we petition? Because there are so many classes we want to take, like 20, this is unacceptable that they limit us to 20 units. And a bunch of them succeeded. They were able to take 22, 23, 24 units. I took the first semester, 12 units, the, the absolute bare minimum. And I got a, you know, a, a plus, I ended up great. I graduated the minimum number of units, many easy classes and graded and with a sky high GPA, I was Phi Beta Kappa, distinction, all the awards. I was a star student. And I think I've always kind of had that mindset of if everybody's, it's, uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, if, 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 do you want another example? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This so fascinating. in high school, I went to, you know, high school in New Jersey, public high school. And everybody was obsessed with the key club. That was the, the club, the key club. It was the most prestigious club. Everyone did a key club. I think you helped. Uh, it was something charitable. I don't remember exactly what it was, which, you know, but I, even at that age, I'm like, how much are you actually helping these people or how much is it a status game to get into college? And key club, they met about three times a week, these long meetings, all the smartest kids at Tenafly competed to be in the key club, an officer of the key club, president, vice president, treasurer, secretary. It was like the biggest thing. Everyone was talking about it. Key club, key club, key club. Everyone was going for key club. I immediately sensed this is, I'm out. This is way too much work. All the competition is there. There's got to be an easier way to get some, to get a club in my college membership. So somebody off the record said, did you, no, off, like offhand, he said, Seth, have you heard about the multicultural club, the stupid club? The multicultural club. I go, no, no, what? He goes, the dumbest club, all they do is go to restaurants once a semester and sample the food. And nobody, it's the stupidest club, like no point to it. And so my ears perk up. I go, multicultural club, it's the stupidest club. Nobody was competing for it. No, nothing. I found out about it. I rise to the top of it because there's no competition. I think I ended up maybe president of multicultural club with no work. All I did is go to these uh, Italian restaurant, Spanish restaurant, Mexican restaurant, sampled their food. And then on my college application, without any deception, I got to say president multicultural club and all the colleges are like, that sounds amazing. You know, they didn't know. And while everyone else failed to get to rise up the key club, they were just members of the key club. And I think in my head, a key club and multicultural club, if anything, the multicultural club sounds cooler to me. So I've always had this mindset of where's the inefficiency that I can take advantage of. Wow. Other than our 30 year age difference, we could be twins. <laughs> uh, uh, the, well, another one that's much more serious in terms of um, self-help, if this is a self-help book, which I don't like calling it that, but is like um, when you realize when you're younger, okay, I'm not gonna be able to do this sport. I'm just not good enough. There's not, no reason to even try. And um, you talk about fencing, which is interesting because my father was a fencer. And, you know, you could get a fencing scholarship. You can be great at fencing. You're not going to have a lot of competition getting into it. But the statistics show that you are probably going to get into a good school if you're a really good fencer. And there's other sports like that. But that was fascinating. And also fencing is fun. It's a great sport. It's, it's really fun to do. Yeah. yeah. And that's an example where I was just hurt by a lack of data because I, I tell this story in my book. I really wanted to be an athlete and I didn't know the path. And my dad came up with this idea. I could be the place kicker. Oh, yeah. 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 And he goes, it was totally, you know, I love my dad. I hope I wasn't hard on him. I, you know, I, I was, I hoped it was an endearing story because I'm a big fan of my dad. He's helped me with all these, he's kind of has a similar mindset to me, always giving me the little angle. But that just shows the, the weakness of a non data driven approach where we didn't know. And he's just like, it, it sounded like a good thing, but it's actually not. There was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't working. And if he had known the data, I think I would have maybe tried fencing or something. Uh, yeah, well, that's a good story. Is, um, well, tell the real story about <laughs> you thought you were getting good and then your buddy comes out. Yeah, yeah. I just went to a, I went to a Mets game two days ago with Garrett, who's a, <laughs> a, a, a character in the book. And he had read my book. He said, he said he, it was very flattering, but he thought it was a little too, as the Guardian said, he said it was too self-deprecating. And then I wasn't quite as bad an athlete as I made it out to be. <laughs> but uh, my friend Garrett was 
he towered over me. He was uh, the tallest kid in class. I was the shortest kid in class. And he was just amazing at all these sports. And I do remember I had told him this story before that I thought I was getting, you know, I, th I thought my, after my dad's kicking, it was a 100% true story. After my dad got me this kicking tee, tea, Garrett recalls it too, that it was an orange kicking tee. <laughs> He's like, that I'd practiced day and night and I thought I'd gotten good. And Garrett just walks up one day and just kicks it like you know four times further than I kicked it and I'm just like okay fuck this there's I'm out there's I had a key club moment where I'm like this is not a path to success I got to find something more reasonable so but I never found it in sports except I guess writing about sports which uh yeah no frisbee frisbee I, I can kick butt in frisbee that's the only thing I can do but I, it got it gives me some solace yeah but yeah I mean why they the, the you know, I, I kind of give all this advice, you know, don't try basketball, try fencing, but it, that it's a little like, don't date the hot person. It's easy to date the not high hot person. Nobody dreams of being a fencer <laughs> relative to a basketball player. So it's, it's not that the, I think the real Machiavellian self-help would be the way to somehow you can be the basketball star with that somehow, but that's just, it's impossible. It's hopeless. It's possible. There's just no way. If you're not, you know, if you're not six foot seven and really athletic, you're just not going to be a successful basketball player. Well, I'm kind of like you, but kind of, it's like both books lying. So I have this scar here from when I dropped the ginger ale bottle when I was three years old, 21 stitches. And so in Heidelberg, when you fence, they leave part of your mask open so you can get a scar because it's a mark of honor. So when I was trying to go out with a girl, they would ask me how I got the scar. And I was, you know, I fenced and I was in Heidelberg and, you know, a guy hit me and it, it worked really well. It was, right. but it was all a lie. <laughs> but uh, the other thing that's interesting is I went to with my son, see, I talk all the time. So I went to with my son, the uh, game six of the, uh, the Bulls jazz. And I was sitting right up front and I watched Michael Jordan steal the ball from Carl Malone. Moses Malone, Carmelo, Carmelo, oh. and uh, and then get the, I'm looking at it, this is not possible what he's doing right now. I was actually thinking that what he just did could not actually happen in reality to steal it on one side and pick it up on the other side and then go down the court and do that, just knowing before he even shot it and hanging like that. And I thought this is, and I don't know what that was. I don't know why I'm talking about this, but what is that? I mean, it's just like he could have been the only person on the court and he still would have been able to do that. Yeah. I mean, it's just, well, basketball, I talk about how much genetic it is and the way yeah. you see it is the identical twins in the domination of identical twins in basketball. Which the reason I started thinking about that is I'm a huge Stanford basketball fan, the college team. And we always suck for about 10 years. And then we get a new pair of identical twins, seven footers. So it's the Collins twins, Jason, Jaron Collins. That was the Lopez twins, Brooke and Robin Lopez. And uh, I'm just like, oh, it's, it's very interesting. And, you know, basically what ha well, the, the prevalence of identical twins is a dead giveaway that something is really genetic because identical twins share 100 percent of their genes uh, with each other. So, uh, you know, I think I calculate that if you are an identical twin in the NBA, you know, it's not perfect calculation. There have to be some assumptions, but you're identical. If one identical twin is in the NBA, the chance that another identical twin also reached the NBA is probably greater than 50 percent, which is just so insane. Uh, for something as difficult as making the NBA, where the average person has, you know, one in 60,000 chance. Yeah. If I look like I'm not paying attention is because I'm writing notes because I'll forget everything because I forget everything. But the reason I'm writing down this next question is because go further on that about how, yeah, that works. You know, you do some really good charts in here because they really highlight and they really show uh, graphically what's going on so talk about how in different sports yeah, yeah identical twin doesn't mean a damn thing well well yeah so some things like diving and equestrianism and even weightlifting which i found pretty surprising yeah uh, there 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 have been no identical twins to reach the top of the olympics even though there have been tons of olympic athletes over time which is a clear that these sports are just much less genetic uh, than other sports uh, which is very uh, and even other sport, American sports are just much less genetic than uh, basketball. So baseball, uh, you know, people think people talk about the father son pairs in baseball yeah. and brother pairs. 
which there definitely are a lot of, even more in many ways than basketball, but there are much fewer identical twins. And if you actually think about what that means, it basically means that nurture plays a big role in baseball and nature plays a little bit of a smaller role. So nurture, it, you know, father, sons, brothers, they're going to all have nurture, the same nurture, whereas that identical twins get in addition to the same nurture, they also get the 100% genetic instead of the 50% genetics. So, uh, you know, baseball, I think uh, it, it, genetics play a role, but not nearly as much in basketball. And then what really is important is if you're Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and your father is teaching you good swing mechanics from the age of four and putting you in a batting cage at the age of four and, you know, teaching you everything he knows, that's going to really help you a lot in, uh, in, in baseball. So, and that's, that's probably one of the reasons, uh, you know, baseball, I was just said, I actually went to two, I went to a Mets game Wednesday night with Garrett of, of celebrity of the celebrity in my book. And then I went to a Yankees game last night and we were talking about how many Dominican players there are in baseball. And that's kind of another proof of the power of nurture that one country can just produce. I don't think there's any reason to think that Dominican Republic has unusually strong genetics for baseball but they do have you know early training and early schools and an obsession with baseball that really really helps i think is much harder in basketball where the great basketball players just the seven footers come from wherever uh you know it, it's just like you know patrick ewing's from jamaica and jokic is from poland or, or and dirk nowitzki's from germany and uh and a lot of times what happens is these seven footers don't even play basketball as kids. And then just in high school, they're like here, and then they become a hall of famer. Yeah. I forgot who the Australian guy, I almost have his name in that, that season with the bulls, the Australian guy. Oh, he Luke. Did, was it yeah, Luke, Longley? Luke Longley? Yeah. He was so dumb that when we were staying at the same hotel and when he got out of the, the bus, he hit his head on the thing. And I'm thinking, oh, really? don't you know, haven't you figured it out yet? You're going to hit your head on most things, but he would just stand underneath the basket. But like you said, your statistics show, if you're seven foot, pretty much you can just walk in. And it's, it seems to be the best evidence, one in seven chance of making the NBA if you're seven foot or above, uh, which isn't a hundred percent. And it isn't even as much as an identical twin of an NBA player. It's interesting, but it is enormous. So I mean, a one in seven chance of an NBA player being in the NBA is just insane. And maybe even higher if you're seven, six, seven, seven. There's, I didn't get to the, in the genetic section, it's interesting. We could be looking at a, a, now with genetics, with the science of genetics advancing, you could predict someone's height based on their genetic genome better than you can predict uh, using their parents, which is very interesting because you could imagine. If, if let's say, you know, for if I had kids, uh, or I don't know if you, you're, it sounds like at least in your family, you're probably not six, not really tall genes as well. Like if I have a kid, I, I pretty much know that any kid I have is not going to be six foot seven, six foot eight, six foot nine. But if you're a six foot five, and let's say there's a six foot five man and he reproduces with a six foot woman, then knowing whether they're son or you know daughter also WNBA knowing whether their son's going to be six nine versus six two really changes the calculation of how much time they'd want to devote to basketball right and that we may be getting to a point where genetic genome testing has done that actually Sean Bradley the I don't know the NBA player was seven foot six they looked at his genome and they found that he basically has every gene that's that predicts positive height uh, it's just genome is just filled, but you can ju just by looking at his genome, you can see he's going to be enormous. He just, you know, everything where it's plus or minus on height, he got plus, 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 plus. Yeah. Like two of my grandchildren, they've already predicted they'll be six foot three. Yeah. And, and you can see it happening as we speak, but what about the situation where you got, you know, like Will Smith on that fateful Oscar night, you know, he's playing the father of Serena and Venus and, they're African-American, you only know, have Arthur Ashe and a few others, and he just decides, he decides this is what they're going to do. We're, we're, did they have a predilection for exactly this sport? No, but did he, was it totally nurture? Well, I don't even know, was it totally nurture? Was it nature? You know, 
they don't look like, I mean, they don't have the build of a tall, lanky type tennis player at all. It's more of a muscular look. Yeah, I think there might be, I think there are probably sports uh, where early training and coaching really, really helps. Tennis, golf, I think is another example. Certainly Tiger Woods. His son, yeah. Was, was helped by, uh, you know, his father had a similar plan for him to be a great golf player. Uh, but again, I think it just depends the sport. That's kind of why I want to show that there's just difference in how much genetics play a role in basketball that wouldn't work to the same degree. I don't think you, again, you know, Patrick Ewing, I'm a big Knicks fan. Patrick Ewing was one of the great players of all time and didn't play basketball until high school. He was a soccer player. And I think something, a cricket player, maybe. Uh, and in high school, he moved to Massachusetts and they decided you know, try playing basketball and becomes a hall of famer. Uh, so, you know, you could train your kid forever and you're not going to, you know, I could train my kid forever. There's no way he's going to compete with Patrick Ewing's of the world. And Yeah. But the one example that you do, which really strikes out in the strikes out in the sense of stands out is um, Michael Phelps and that other guy who's yeah, built yeah. like him. So Michael Phelps, you know, it's like he's incredibly tall. He has incredible large hands, even like webbed almost. And so he's built to be that short legs, which is very helpful. Yeah, and short legs. And then you talk about who's the other guy? I can't remember his name. Yeah, a Moroccan track runner who's the same, who's a uh, five foot eight. Michael Phelps, I think six foot five. Uh, the Moroccan running's five foot eight, and they have the same length legs. So, uh, because in running tall legs is really helpful and in swimming short legs is really helpful. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, like, it's like he had, Michael Phelps had the perfect body for exactly what he ended up doing. It all, but then see, that's the other thing. All you need is a push. You have to have a push or else you have to have a passion. You had the passion for a lot of things when you were younger. You just realized you couldn't do them. Yeah, I had, yeah, I had the passion. I had the push. I just didn't have the genetics. <laughs> <laughs> well so if if you were gonna like you know, winding up here if you were gonna say i mean i can if you were gonna say okay do you want to call it a self-help book do you call these self-help books yeah i called it a self-help book in part because i wanted to recover uh the term self-help a lot of people rebel against self-help because you know as you said it it doesn't have a good uh doesn't have a good cachet it's self-help is considered kind of skeezy and scam scammers right self-help and i never really understood that because it, 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 there, there, a lot of people say they write books they, they say that you know malcolm gladwell or david brooks or some of these other famous writers write self-help for people who wouldn't be caught dead reading self-help and i just never understood that why should you not be caught dead reading self-help why what's wrong with wanting to improve yourself it, I don't see how that's unintellectual or not serious. Uh, learning about what makes you feel happy or what makes a good romantic partner. These all seem like completely respectable uh, subjects. So I, I start my book, I say it's self-help for data geeks. Uh, I, I kind of try to own the term. You know, similar, it's kind of a minority group sometimes do that. They try to take control of it use a term that's pejorative and they recover it. They just say, I'm going to use that term. So I tried to do that in my small way with self-help self-help by saying, instead of shying away from it, I just say it's self-help. But then the punchline is that everyone complained that it doesn't really work as self-help. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, so like, you know, the classic interviewer question, what do you hope people take away from this? It's not really that it's like, part of it's like formulaic, but you don't want people to sit down before they decide, hey, I'm going to go out tonight to a bar and set up a dating app. And this is what I'm going to look for. And you take out your calculator and you're not, you're not, you're not asking for that. But what are you asking for? I think is a method, I think just an awareness that there's data out there. So I talk about in the scholarship section, this guy, Patrick O'Rourke, who his, he was at dinner and he had a son who was a baseball player and his friends at dinner said your son should switch to lacrosse because right. lacrosse gives you a better chance of getting a college scholarship and O'Rourke most people if you hear that you just say you the next day you talk to your son you say have you considered lacrosse do you want to play it 
my friends say it's a better bet for a scholarship. And what O'Rourke did instead was he collect track down data on every sport in the country, how many high school athletes there are, how many college scholarships there are, and what the ratio is. And he found out that actually uh, lacrosse is no better than baseball is a little bit better than lacrosse, in fact. And I think that kind of mentality I'd like people to take away, that don't just accept anything you hear, but really think through whether this is true and is there any data, even just Googling. Now anybody can just Google that chart or, you know, it's in my book, but it's just available on Google. So if someone tells you something, don't just accept it, but try to find the data on it. Because a lot of times people say things they're just totally wrong, like that lacrosse gives a better chance of college scholarship than baseball. Well, I'll give you a perfect example from your book of what people might not do for any number of reasons. And it's hard work to do the research, although you, like you said, you could find it on Google in a minute and you give it all to us anyways. Okay. If I want to have a better chance of my kid making a lot of money, being happy, I need to move to Spokane, Washington, or I need to move to, what was the best one? I forgot. Seattle, 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 yeah. Washington. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So, yeah. So. But, but I, I think that's, that, that's taking a little, that's saying a little too seriously. Like if you, so they, they, there have been very convincing studies finding how much the neighborhood impacts a kid's success. And uh, they've broken down every part of the United States into how much the neighborhood matters. Now, I wouldn't recommend you just go to that site and tomorrow move to the neighborhoods that, that's best. But you could at least, if you're, uh, if you're undecided, if you're picking between two neighborhoods, look at the data to find the one that's likely to be better or uh, confirm that the neighborhood you're living in isn't like really awful. Uh, well, it's like here, just outside of Philadelphia. There's one area right near me that these are, we're divided into townships. Yeah, or school districts. So, you know, you have this one school district, Downingtown, which is voted like the best school district in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Then you have one on the other side, which I'm not going to name, which isn't considered as good. It's still good. But when you're selling houses, which is some of the stuff my, my family does, they're just going to, they'll immediately go to the Downingtown area school district. I mean, that's like yeah. the number one thing. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, but, but a lot, I think a lot of what the data says is that we have some misconceptions about uh, what what work what what makes a good neighborhood? And a lot of times, things like the rank of the school, the you know how expensive it is, they don't really predict the success oh. of the neighborhood as much as we sometimes suspect. So, I agree, uh, and I yeah. agree. Making a private school choice in an area where the public school seems to have a better infrastructure, better technological stuff, better teachers, teachers get paid better. Yeah, but the private school has this cachet, as you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, the evidence is that schools matter a lot less than we think they do. And a lot of the correlations, you know, even in, in, I talk about this, everybody lies, even the correlation between, um, you know, going to Harvard, if you look at, uh, you know, people went to Harvard and people who went to Penn State, people who went to Harvard earn a lot more money, have more prestigious jobs. But most of that, maybe all of it is due to selection, that people who are more driven and more talented or more likely to go to Harvard. And when you take that away, it seems going to Penn State is just as good as going to Harvard. So, uh, yeah, so, so I think there's a lot of misconceptions. A lot of the fanciness and a lot of the, you know, the, a lot of things are, a lot of the positive outcomes that some of these fancy schools advertise isn't uh, causal. They're not causing them. They're just taking advantage of the fact that they have good students going to them. Yeah, I know. It's the more I think about your book, the more the word shiny comes into play because yeah. all this stuff is shiny. Whether yeah, I think we're tricked by shininess in so many arenas. That's a good point. I didn't even think about that. And, you know, it's, 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 it's happiness, the section where we're tricked by social media, that's probably shiny. They're tr tr putting these light, these, you know, fa fancy things that evoke our curiosity in front of us, but doesn't actually make us happy. Whereas well, now gardening, have, gardening have, is less shiny, but makes people way happier. Well, it's like you have to have these interviews now to see if you can get into the kindergarten, you know, in a private school. Yeah. It's like, but it's shiny, you know. Oh, I want to go to the place where they require an interview before they'll let me in. It's just, yeah. But, you know, it's playing devil's advocate again about schools and it could change your entire life and did change my life and may have changed your life is, doesn't make any difference whether you're taking logic or statistics. If your teacher sucks, yeah, 
it's going to change your life. And if your teacher is the best teacher you ever had, your thesis advisor, the political economist guy who died when he was young. Alicina. Yeah. I mean, that probably meant a lot to you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I didn't think so much about the shininess thing. I think you're probably right. I also have a section of the businesses that go out, that fold the fastest. And record stores, a little bit of older studies. So back, back when there were record stores, record stores are the quickest to fold. The average record store lasts 2.75 years. And then toy stores do terribly. Clothing, uh, most clothing stores, uh, beauty supply stores. And that's another example of shininess, sexiness. Uh, you know, like there are movies made about record store, people who own record stores. There aren't really movies made about people who own a beverage distribution business. Uh, even though, you know, auto, an auto dealership, even though those are way better businesses. Yeah, try owning an independent bookstore. Yeah. <laughs> but we got all kinds of movies and books, you know, the Paris bookseller, there's all these library books. Yeah. It doesn't really, doesn't really help me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I need to go to that. I think I'll shut it down now. <laughs> well, this has been great. Sorry I talked so much. Um, yeah, it was a great book. And also, yeah, so I didn't, I hate to say it, but I didn't know the line, the book about liars, you know, so now I have both of them sitting next to each other. So it makes a nice pair. Yeah, everyone um, says that my titles are always so depressing. Everybody yeah. lies, don't trust your gut. Yeah, but they're compelling. Those but uh, yeah, but they're not yours. You don't even think of them. Other people think of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Seth. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks I so really much for having me. Okay, see ya. Yeah.